Hello and welcome back to another episode of Across the Pond, Barry. We're 70 episodes into this thing. Uh, just crazy. And as as we go on and we keep doing this, uh, having a lot of fun with this live streaming software as well. Yeah, it's been really, really cool. Obviously, we've got a, quite a cool show tonight. We're bringing some yeah. new guests on, which is going to be very exciting. And that's why we're a little bit late, but we're fine. We figured it all out. <laughs> we've got our scenes ready. And I'm very excited for this one. 70 feels like a good number, Chad. I don't know why, but it feels like a really solid number. And uh, yeah, I'm excited to jump into all the stuff we're going to chat about today. How's your week Indeed. been so far? Yeah, no, it's been it's been good. The week has actually just flown by like uh, like a crazy sort of. I I don't know what what's happened with it to be honest. Uh, but it's been <laughs> good. Uh, I mean, you've had just had a, a series of hockey matches now, and uh, you know, about to fall asleep on us. But hopefully, hopefully you'll stay awake. <laughs> Hopefully, Chad. The most exciting news is I didn't injure myself, and so that is a win on my this on my part. So no injuries, even though I'm a little bit tired. No injuries. So hopefully, I'll, I'll hopefully I won't nod off during the episode, Chad. <laughs> I hope not, uh, because we are speaking about some really important stuff tonight. Uh, ladies and gents, strap in for across the pond. The week that was. Alrighty, uh, let's start off with the week that was and uh, quite a crazy week. Now, I say the week that was, but uh, what we're about to talk about has actually been over the last sort of two weeks. Um, the story has just been kind of unfolding. Um, and of course, you saw it in the title. It's, it's probably why you're here. Uh, we're talking about Sarah Everard, uh, a lady that went missing. She uh, just went for a walk. Uh, well, basically left her friend's house at around 9 p.m. in London. Uh, in, in sort of South London, Clapham, uh, with, for what was going to be a, a kind of 50-minute walk to where she lived in Brixton. And essentially, she went, she went missing, and I myself, uh, you know, obviously being in, in London, saw all of the appeals on, on social media. Uh, and essentially, you know, a whole lot of people looking to see, essentially, if anyone had, has, has seen her, uh, if, uh, you know, basically wh where, where she was last seen, uh, trying to track her location and essentially what what they were able to do is piece together using sort of cctv footage from a whole lot of people's uh you know video doorbells uh to to piece together where she was where she was last seen all of that kind of stuff so i'm going to quickly bring up a little a little map here so so this is essentially where she where she left her, her friend's house uh went through what what is clapham common which uh yeah well that's you know speculation that she went through the park uh, a really really big park piece of open you know green space went for a walk and uh, obviously that's where she was sort of last seen obviously you know now we've got a little bit of hindsight uh, and essentially her absolutely devastating her remains were, were later found more than 50 miles away from where she was last seen. Uh, so this is a woodland in, in Kent, uh, east, you know, east, east, London, east, east of London uh, in the UK. Um, and essentially, a police officer, a guy by the name of Wayne Cousins, uh, is now in custody. Uh, a man by the name, yeah, Wayne Cousins, he's 48 years old. Um, and he's been charged with kidnap and murder. Uh, and the trial's set to take place later this year. So obviously, you know, absolutely traumatizing, uh, devastating events, of course. Um, and, uh, you know, just going into it a little bit as well, Barry, the, this police officer who, who did this allegedly uh, was involved in an incident of indecent exposure uh, in a McDonald's just a few days before. I think it was three, three or so, so days before. And he was still on duty. So he was still with the force. Uh, you know, doing his normal kind of day job. Um, and the, the, the day that this happened, uh, he had got off duty at least nine hours uh, before she went missing. So very much an active uh, person on the police force uh, who, who, who is alleged to have done this. Um, and yeah, absolutely devastating events. Yeah, really, really sad. And I think what makes this so traumatic, Chad, is that this is not an isolated story. Unfortunately, this is something we've been been seeing a lot over the last couple of years. We've chatted about it previously on Across the Pond, the, these really, really tragic stories of, of, of women being being harassed and kidnapped and murdered by men um, in, in, in instances where they shouldn't be 
there shouldn't be a reason to worry. Like you should be able yeah. to walk home just without worrying. And that's kind of how life is supposed to be. But unfortunately, the way that our society is structured and the way that things happen is that these stories are just, they're, they're too common, right? Unfortunately, it's something we have to keep talking about again and again and again. And so when something like this does come on the news and it becomes a big story where it is in the world, it really is a reckoning point for us to talk about what does this mean for the greater society? Like it's a tragic, tragic story. And but how can we how can we turn this into something that actually creates change? How can we use this as an opportunity to start a conversation that really needs to be had? Um, and so uh, our sincere condolences to the family, our sincere condolences to everyone involved, especially in London. I know it's a very, very tough time and, and morale is down there at the moment because of this kind of story. Um, and unfortunately, it's one of those things, Chad, we have to keep talking about because it doesn't feel like things are changing. It doesn't feel like we're making progress in this sense. Um, and so, yeah, when, when I saw this happen, it, it broke my heart. It really did. Yeah, absolutely. And and you're so right, uh, just in terms of the, the morale on the ground. Um, so, I mean, I think what a lot of uh, young ladies and uh, yeah, I suppose just everyone really wanted to do is, is obviously show their, their, their grievance for, for this and, and kind of, you know, start to start to question how this kind of stuff happens in in 2021 in this world that we that we're in. Uh, and basically, they, they organized a, a vigil. So I've just got a little shot there as well of, of this vigil. And uh, there was there was quite a lot of back and forth beforehand uh, in the organizers trying to organize a very quiet, safe, socially distanced place really where people can come together and just pay their respects if you if you will um and essentially those it went through court there was a whole lot of uh, funding that was raised uh you know to, to actually fight uh, being able to actually have this vigil and that was all stopped that was all um you know turned down and basically what, what ended up happening is the vigil went ahead uh not officially planned but it still went ahead a whole lot of people uh, came through uh, but instead what it was called was was reclaim the streets there was a hashtag that was trending um, this idea of uh, the the streets being for everyone uh, the streets being for for ladies all times of day uh, all streets not certain roads alleyways you know you know the, you know the story um, and and basically what we saw is we saw a lot of uh, you know interesting tactics deployed by the police as well um, you know in in kind of manhandling a lot of these ladies uh, who, who were really there to to kind of pay their respects as well so I, I, just to, to kind of bring up everyone to speed uh, you know if you're listening from overseas you you're not you know close to the UK press that's where we're at at the moment uh, and of course on the back of this like you say Barry we're now starting to ask questions of of what we can do about this uh, obviously this was an extreme case where a lady was abducted and murdered uh, but the question really being, does this start somewhere else? Does this start in, you know, smaller level interactions? Uh, the, the, the sort of staring, the stalking, the, the heckling, the, uh, you know, following, groping, all of these kinds of things uh, that a lot of ladies have had a whole lot of experiences in. And, and I've been kind of devastated to hear some of these experiences. There was a poll that was released, Barry, and that said, I think it was a YouGov poll that said 97% of all ladies aged 18 to 24 in the UK have been subject to sexual harassment before. Uh, and that's a crazy statistic, really. It really is. It really is. And it's it's a sad, sad state of affairs. I, I remember when the Me Too movement really gathered steam a couple of years ago, yeah. and I, I was starting to have these conversations with female friends, and I was blown away by how many stories I just wasn't aware of and how every single woman that I spoke to had these sorts of stories, had the story about at the bar where they were harassed by someone, had yep. the story about being stalked, had the story about all of these horrible things that happened that as men, we just don't have to deal with, right? And so a as a female person, you've almost got, a, you've got lim limited freedom. <clears throat> you don't have the same freedoms that yep. men do because you're always worried about this happening. And you've got this like, they, they kind of described to me as a low hum of anxiety all the time. Yeah. Whenever you're in public spaces, whenever you're interacting with men, whenever you're in those situations, you've got this like thing in your back of your head as to where could this go? Um, and that really broke my heart a couple of years ago, and it breaks my heart again today when we talk about stories like this. Um, and so I think I think it's something we need to be speaking about more. We need to be putting these stories into the light. I think we made a lot of progress in the last couple of years trying to like actually bring this stuff into the light and actually confront it and look it in the face because that's the only way we can make any change, Chad. Yeah, I completely agree. And, uh, you know, although you empathize deeply with all of those stories you've heard, 
we are men, right? And there's a limitation to our understanding of this topic. Uh, certainly until we go out and extensively try and understand and, and hear experiences, hear stories. Uh, and then then only can we start to really shift, um, you know, the, the treatment that, that, that men, you know, give towards women. And ultimately as well, uh, you know, be able to become accountable, be able to hold friends accountable. Um, and I, th I think this is really the most important productive type of conversation we can have, which is exactly why, as you mentioned, Barry, uh, we brought in two guests tonight, um, wonderful ladies who are, are really quite sort of brave and in, in just talking through some of the experiences, uh, some of those things that a lot of people might seem insignificant but that really builds up and compounds uh, into what is the crescendo that is the event that we saw uh, of you know Sarah Everard so let's give a quick welcome uh, you know from Australia in, in Sydney uh, and uh, also in London as well welcome ladies hi thanks guys nice to be here hi. my name's Danica just by the way <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for joining. Good to and, be here. Thanks for having us on. Awesome. Thank you very much. Yeah, and uh, yeah, Ashley as well is, is also joining. So I think let's get started maybe with uh, maybe with Danica. So uh, you know, just being in London, uh, let's let's just kick this off. Uh, you obviously lived in South Africa before. Um, I can relate on the mm -hmm. on the sort of safety perspective of always looking over your shoulder, uh, getting the keys ready. I've heard all of, all of those kinds of stories, uh, but certainly on the kind of gender front, uh, what do you what do you think when you see a man walking down the road? Um, you know, and in, in London. I mean, in all honesty, the only age group that you that I feel comfortable with is seventy up, maybe. And right. um, it's it's it is uncomfortable. It's you, and it's it's not fair because obviously it's not it's not every male that is like that. But it we've had so many things happen to us that become part of your daily life and how we are just built to kind of deal with it and like move on and not even question it anymore. We're just, it's just what happens. It's just mm. how women need to survive and what we need to do to make it home at the end of the night. So largely like moving over to London was, I mean, it was a large part of it was the safety portion of it, Definitely. but even in London, I mean, it's, you don't know, you don't know who you're coming across. And I mean, I sure you get females that are also, you know you don't quite know but it's you can't help but feel especially once it's dark you can't help but feel like especially when you're alone or i mean i went out on a girls night when we had that break in our lockdown around november i think and um i mean that was in our local area and just me walking from the restaurant to my car park was it was quite quite something so much so that i actually followed another couple Cross the street from someone, a male walk, a single male walking towards me, and then followed another couple around the park and to the car as far as I could, just so I wouldn't be on my own after dark in the area. And it's not a bad area; it's not, it's yeah. not notoriously dangerous or anything like that. But and it wasn't late; it was I think the restaurants were all closing at 10 p.m. anyway. Um, but it's dark; you don't know. There's there's alleyways, there's cars, there's not enough people on the streets. Um, and even if there is, you just don't know. You go into pubs, you go into bars, and you just get the only way to really defend yourself is to actually start to become rude and mm. just brush it off. I mean, I've even gotten to the point now after this whole thing with Sarah is that I've ordered um, um, some alarms that attach to your keys. It's a little keychain, and you pull the silver thingy out, and it sirens this, this really, really big alarm just to you know, bring awareness to what's going on around you and hopefully someone can hear you and see you and be close enough to help you if you need it. So it's gotten to that point where, you know, and I think everything with Sarah is also, it's, it triggers a lot for females because as I said, it just becomes how it is for us because we, it's all we really know. We don't, we don't. And, and then even speaking to my husband about it, um, you know, and speaking about the level of insecurity that you feel as a female, and if he could relate and he's just like, no, no, I, I don't have that. I'm not, I'm, I don't really think twice about going out at night or, you know, doing, getting drunk and getting public transport home or anything like that. He doesn't think twice about it. And that to me is mind blowing. I mean, 
as a female, you you share your cabs with your your girlfriends as far as you can, or you get someone to come and fetch you, or it's it's um and it, as I said, it's just the norm for us, which it shouldn't be. We shouldn't have to feel like we're threatened so often, you know. Completely agree. Um, I mean. You know, let's let's move on over to uh, to Ashley. Do, I mean, do you do you have the same sort of experience uh, being in Australia? Uh, you know, I know I know it's sort of ge- geographies is kind of a little bit relevant, I guess. Uh, but but it seems like the experience is kind of the same no matter where you look. Yes, um, it absolutely is. I think being in Australia, I haven't, in all honesty, I haven't felt as unsafe, obviously, as South Africa, and it mm. is. I think quite a bit more safe than London. I also have lived in London um, a a few years ago and I do feel a much uh, greater degree of safety here. But even so, I mean, it's just the cat calling while you're walking home. And I think it's it's the knowledge that if if someone does take that additional step, that you won't be able to do anything about it. And I think that's where the biggest fear resides. And I also think... um, because you've moved countries and you've kind of left your pretty much whole list of people behind, you don't have that as as good a support as previously. I know in South Africa, my friends and I always used to make sure that we used to message each other when we got home. And our message was, please let me know when you're home safe, which is very sad. I mean, that shouldn't be the norm, um, but that's that's kind of become the, the, the normal kind of goodbye greeting um, on the way home. Um, I've definitely got more examples um, in South Africa where things have happened and I know um, on even university campus in South Africa when we had evening lectures we would all make sure that we walked home together um, and you didn't even feel safe in your own university campus and I think it, I, I think it's um, very sad that this has become the norm and that women feel like this and that um, this is kind of just accepted as the way it is. I, I, I want to touch on a point you made there, Ash, which I think is a very good one, is that sometimes when, when, when males hear about the situation, they often assume that it's a very small portion of men who are generally going out to be malicious and are criminals and whatnot. But from the stories that I've heard, and I think, Ash, you can you talk this as well, is that it comes from the nice guys as well. It comes from guys who just the societal, the way that, that, that our interactions are structured and kind of the norms, like you say, that have been built, especially when there's a little bit of alcohol involved, especially when people are out mm-hmm. on the town, all of a sudden, someone you think you thought was your friend or someone you, you, you're out with, all of a sudden they start to take chances, right? And then they're not respecting your, your boundaries, not respecting who you are as a person. And I've just been blown away to hear those sorts of stories because it's, it's, it's one thing to talk about the criminals. And unfortunately, there's always going to be criminals who are going to try and take advantage of people. But it's that, it's that underlying societal norm of a nice guy with a little bit of alcohol in him all of a sudden pushing those boundaries. Does, does, does that resonate with you, Ash? Absolutely. I mean, one example I can give actually happened uh, in Australia with a work colleague. Um, We went out for a drink and he immediately tried to start making advances on me. And when I pushed back, and obviously it's a very awkward situation because he's your work colleague and you don't want to make the situation awkward at work. Um, And I pushed back very firmly, but as, as nicely as I could. And he just kept and kept pushing. And, um, you know, I felt, I felt very upset about that whole situation. And what I think really um, gets to me, at least, is the fact that I feel like the burden's always on the female to do something. I mean, even in the news, you'll say, people will say that the female, maybe she shouldn't have walked home alone or maybe she shouldn't have done this. But the fact that this is the societal norm, that the burden is now on the female to take all these precautions rather than focusing on the male who should actually not be doing this. And I think it it filters down into the way um, males interact with women and the respect that they show to women. And I think there there is a hashtag um, trending of not all men. And I understand that it is a generalized statement that that people make, but the, the, the basis of it is that men need to start calling each other out and need to start putting their friends in place when something like this happens. Well, that's that would that, that's exactly what my next point was going to be. So to kind of take Barry's point further, uh, a, a nice guy with alcohol in him, plus a nice guy with a whole bunch of friends around him. Um, you know, what sort of role do you think guys should have in, in calling out their own friends? Uh, Danica, on to you. 
I mean, it's I understand it's a big a big thing amongst guys to to call out your mate when you're all having a lads night out and you you want to be the big macho guy and you're going to get the girl and all that. But at the same time, we're human beings, and I don't think I think a lot of men aren't actually brave enough to stand up to their friends. And mm. you know, if I think if you can see that a girl is uncomfortable and if there's something that you can be doing to make her feel more uncomfortable and you can see that your friend is pushing his luck, but he thinks it's funny and your other friends are laughing and they think it's funny, but you can, you can tell that this human being is not okay with this. Just stand up, just stand up. And even if you, even if you can't take the plunge of standing up in front of your friends, go and check on that girl and be like, sorry, I, I'm sorry about my mates. Are you okay? Let me just check in with you and see how you're feeling. That's, that's a start. I mean, I know that it's a, it, it'll take a long time to get to a point where men are brave enough to stand up to each other because this is testosterone and there's this macho thing. And like, it's still, it's, it's almost ingrained in society that women are, you know, things and pieces of meat or whatever whatever some men do think i mean mm. i even saw the statistic uh some of the responses to the guardian statistic and they were i mean they were the comments were atrocious and they were like oh like, something like oh lads we need to get other three percent then don't we with like making all these jokes and it's like wh where are these people how are they how are they even commenting about this you know and that that's the kind of conversations that someone needs to and it does. It, the thing is, is my social media after the after the thing with Sarah was full of um, stats and things about women and violence against women and all of this stuff. And the main social media was quiet, completely quiet. And the th the problem comes is that we're all angry and we're all talking to each other. And our, my social media is filled majority with female um, females that I follow or that follow me or whatever. And the problem comes is that we're all talking to each other but we're we are aware of all of this this is this is our life you know and the problem comes now where there was an opportunity for men to speak up and share all these stories that were going around share these stats and say you know like let their voice be known because then that person that guy that did share something to his social media for example maybe his mate would then think twice about it and be like okay even sure. even if it's just in the company of that guy to be like okay let me be more aware and conscious of when i'm in his company to watch myself rather than and that's all we need that's all we need is that tiny little snowball to start and someone to just start opening up the conversation in the male demographic because yeah. it's not the females we're talking about it we're aware of it we experience it daily it's we need we now need our men to you know the good the actual good guys we need them to, even though they are good guys, they need to help us and just like step it up a little bit for us. Because again, even if we are to speak to men that are being cheeky or arrogant, or you know, there's also a boundary where someone, a, a, a guy approaches you and you feel uncomfortable, you you then again don't know how he's going to react. So if you push too hard, he may take it really badly, and he, his ego may be really damaged, and you never know what's going to happen at the end of the night. So. It's really amongst men that just something small, something so small, just to start a conversation or bring awareness to someone that makes an, one little inappropriate joke even that they think is harmless. Just call call them out and be like, dude, maybe maybe we shouldn't be, you know, making her feel that way or or something. I don't know, but it, it needs to start somewhere. It's, it's such a good point because that is the only way we're going to get some sort of sustainable change. With any of these sorts of systemic issues, it can feel overwhelming. It can feel like, how the hell are we supposed to solve this? How are we supposed to wave this wand and kind of release all of this, all of this stress and all this tension? And it starts, like you say, with the small conversations around the braai or within your friend groups. And and it's it's through those examples is how we're going to change society. It's not going to change overnight. Like we, we, we can't be naive enough to think it's going to change quickly. But with every single conversation that you have, you are trying to set new norms. You're trying to shift things further towards the kind of society we want to build. I know in my life, like when the Me Too movement was happening, I had a lot of conversations with my friends, yeah. but then it sort of faded away. And I kind of lost when, when it left the news cycle. Unfortunately, those conversations left as well. And so I'm as much at, at, at fault here because when it's not on the news, men don't talk about it. And like you say, that's a problem. Um, and so I think it, I, we really must call on each other, especially as, as as men, to kind of talk about these things realistically and honestly within our friend groups, because that is the only way we're going to get this ball rolling. Otherwise, we're just running against a brick wall. 
Yeah, completely agree. Completely, completely agree, Barry. And that's kind of the reason why we wanted to, to uh, you know, bring this up here uh, to to bring some female perspectives into this because uh, you know, as you, if you keep to your own, uh, what's the word? If if you keep to 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 your own uh, sort of group of of friends and stuff, you, you're not gonna you're not gonna hear the sort of feedback that will make that meaningful uh, sort of progress. So, um, you know, Ashley, let, let's let's move on to you quickly again. Um, just in terms of the those seemingly imp- like unimp- un- unimportant and unsig- insignificant mm-hmm. sort of things that that sort of look that last one or two seconds too long, uh, a guy walking maybe a little bit too close to you. Um, wh- what sort of what sort of experience have you had with that before? And uh, I mean, do you have anything that could kind of shift maybe someone's perspective on on something that they may have never thought about uh, intentionally before? Yeah, I mean, one example that comes to mind actually happened in South Africa outside of a police station. And I was just walking in to commission some documents and there was a whole group of guys on the other side of the road that started catcalling. And I think um, as soon as you respond um, at that st- at, at, in that moment, I said, leave me alone. And then everyone starts laughing. And that makes you even more scared and angry and you, you don't know what to do. It, uh, it happened outside of a police station. And I think what makes me quite upset is that people don't take it as seriously and they they will just say to you oh it's just a cat call just leave them alone but it's not that you know I think it's it's the fear that if something else happens besides that being inappropriate but if they take something and a, a bigger step um you won't be able to do anything and I think it's that knowledge that generates all this this fear and anxiety and um at that stage, I didn't feel that I could even go into the police station and say that these guys won't be able to, you know, that the, the police wouldn't do anything about it. And I think that's that's quite sad. And, and I don't think women are taken seriously enough when they talk about it. Yeah. But from a guy's perspective, I mean, perhaps it could be giving women a little bit more space or crossing over to the other side of the road if you see people, if you see a woman walking home at night or you know um just trying to alleviate that fear and give her a bit of space and peace of mind but other than that I'm actually not entirely sure at this stage Mm. what what a guy can do except starting that conversation and being aware and and treating women with respect yeah 100 percent, 100 percent. I mean some of the sort of uh other interesting things that I think definitely need to be addressed, certainly in the UK's uh, side, is the, the lack of ladies actually reporting incidences because they, you know, they just either are embarrassed by it, um, you know, or they don't think anything will be done about it. Um, you know, is that something you think about, Danica? If, if anything were to happen, you know, do you feel uh, like you can report it and something actually happens? I think it depends on the severity of the situation, which mm. even saying that it, it shouldn't depend on it. If, if someone comes into your space and makes you feel in um, threatened in any way, that shouldn't be okay. Um, but having said that, you know, if, if we were to report every spot of harassment that we feel it, I mean, the police would be inundated with, with all of these things that I think eventually it would just become so um, diluted Mm. from the real, real, like serious cases. And I'm not saying that there aren't that, you know, like someone groping you in a bar or something that, that is, it's serious, Mm. but at the same time, it happens so much that, you know, where, where do you draw the line to take it further to? And at the same time, you also can't help but feel like, a little embarrassed about it you know like is is my case big enough to take to the police will they care will they do anything am i wasting everyone's time and again if it's something bigger than that um again it's you're embarrassed you're always made to feel as ash said women are often made to be the problem and we should have done something different in that situation we shouldn't we shouldn't have gotten drunk or we shouldn't really be walking home alone. We shouldn't go to the bathroom alone. Like you wonder why girls always go to the bathroom and whatnot. And yes, it's for a little chat, but at the same time, that that walk from where you are to the bathroom is, you know, like you don't know who you're gonna come across. You don't know what's gonna happen. And 
as the night goes on, say you're in a club, for example, and you're out dancing with your girlfriends, you don't go to the bathroom on your own because you don't know what's going to happen along the way. So, you know, where at what point is it that you do report something? Because it's there's just so much. There's so, so much that I don't even, I mean, as I think majority of men, I don't think they even realize and not all men do it. So, you know, you don't, you don't realize how much we actually do deal with this. And I don't think, I don't think age is a factor. I don't think race is a factor. I don't think how you look is a factor. I think men just, they like the thrill of it. They like the, the, almost like some of them do like to see us squirm a little and like to see how uncomfortable they can make us and see where it goes. So in terms, in terms of reporting it, I don't think, honestly, I don't think I would um, report a case of, you know, say I'm on public transport and mm. I'm groped or something. I honestly don't think I would report it because I don't feel like it's important enough, which is a problem. I mean, honestly, that is a problem and that's yeah. where we should we should be speaking up about it and we we should be reporting it because it's not okay no one no one touching you when you're not wanted no one being in your space when they're when they can tell that you're uncomfortable and threatened like it's just not okay and mm. as i've said before females are we're conditioned to deal with it we're conditioned to to learn and know what to do and how to react and what not to say and what what buttons not to push in order to make it out okay because again as ash said someone comes a little too far into your space and it's like, you know that you don't stand a chance because, you know, naturally women are, you know, now this is a big stereotype, but on, on the whole, women are not as strong as, you know, like, and also I think it, was, it does come down to the kind of man that does approach a woman. They are generally, they know that they're stronger than you. They know that they can intimidate you and they know that they can come into your space and you can't do anything. So, yeah, um, sorry, in terms of reporting it, I don't I don't think I would, in all honesty, no. Yeah, and that's, I mean, that's really, really sad. I mean, you know, some of the stats of the, the actual kind of rape convictions are less than 5% in the UK, uh, which is, you know, which is, which is staggering. Uh, and I, I think that does lead to, to people not even coming forward to reporting. Um, and, and of course, you know, in terms of disincentives um, for, for the guys who are doing this, uh, it's definitely not sending sending the right sort of message. Um, so, so yeah. The the other thing I wanted to uh, mention, I, I was just, while you were talking, uh, just kind of uh, bringing up a comment from, from Robin, who completely related to your point on uh, just, you know, always pooling, carpooling together with friends and always tracking each other's location. Um, you know, in, in terms of all of these measures that you, you guys have had to take, uh, like that little device that you've just bought now, you know, although it's great that you've got this device, it, it really is quite sad that you have to go out and, and do these kind of things uh, to protect your own self. Um, you know, Ashley, w what do you think about, you know, actually having to go out there and, and do all of these extra, uh, put all these extra measures into place uh, where you really, really shouldn't have to? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, as I said before, the burden is always placed on the woman to take the precautions. Um, I know at our university campus, for example, one of our friends used to walk around with a taser at night, just mm -hmm. held on by her side, just in case that we came across someone on a university campus, which should theoretically be safe. Um, you know, and, and, and I think too often that men will believe men over women. I think there's a stigma attached to a woman saying some, some person, a male colleague, for example, sexually harassed me or made inappropriate advances. The example I'm thinking of is that when this colleague, the incident happened with this colleague that I was talking about, and this actually came from a woman. Um, and she said to me, the first thing that she said to me was, well, was, well what did you say to him? And I actually had to go and snapshot the messages on our work chat, which literally said, let's Gosh. meet up for a drink because we're both South Africans. And um, so it's actually, to correct my comment, it's actually not just men, it's women. And I think the, the stigma is always is, is attached to a woman and a woman is the person generally not believed. And the woman has to take all these steps just to prove that she didn't do something to make the men behave that way. 
And I think that is something that is fundamentally wrong with the approach um, that, that people take. And, you know, I had to take snapshots of that as a kind of protection mechanism if it ever came out and to actually prove to people that, no, I didn't say anything to this guy to lead him on. And it shouldn't be like that. And that's, that's um, you know, and taking the precautions that you have to have a taser or taking, uh, you know, the keychain, And it's just, it's just very sad, sad and it, should, it shouldn't be like that at all. I mean, uh, they say that um, a woman, a man's biggest fear may perhaps be murdered or being thrown in jail for the rest of his life. And a woman's biggest fear is being sexually assaulted. And that I think is the, the kind of bottom line of it to put it into perspective. I, I, I think that's why I'm I'm so grateful that we're having this conversation is because we need we need women to really talk about this because if if it just stays in the darkness if it stays in the conversations in the bathroom if 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 we don't hear about it in our day to day lives nothing's ever going to change and so I'm very grateful for you guys to coming on and, and sharing these difficult stories and being brave enough to talk about these issues because this is what we need we, we the only way we solve this is through conversation the only way we solve this is by changing societal norms and actually bringing this into the light. This shouldn't be a shameful thing that we're embarrassed about. This shouldn't be something that mm. we're worried about talking because what is what are people going to think about us? People are they going to think we're lying or they think we're over exaggerating? We, we should never be in that position because every time uh, someone brings up a story like this, we need to be taking it seriously. We need to be talking about it. I, I, I see we've got we've got a we've got a comment from Mexico. It's crazy how widespread this is. Mm. Like here in Mexico, it says ten women are killed every single day, and one in three women suffer from physical or sexual violence violence. This is not an isolated thing. This is not a South African thing. This is not a London thing. This is a, a, a worldwide conversation that needs to be had. And I think that the more we talk about it, the better. This this cannot be something that only comes up when there's something huge in the yep. news. We can't wait for a crisis or a tragedy or a murder of some sort before we start talking about these things. It has to become part of our morality. It has to become part of how we're thinking about building our, our lives. And I think our generation has made a little bit of progress. We, we've started to talk about we started to talk about masculinity. We've started yeah. to talk about some of the stuff more seriously, but there's still such such a long way to go. And I just want to call on everyone listening or everyone watching, whether you're with us live or you're listening to it after the fact. Please start these conversations in your social circles. You have to be talking about this with your friends because I know when I started talking to my female friends and asking about their experiences, I was flabbergasted by the stories that came back. Yeah. And all that took from me was just a question to them, right? And the moment I asked the question, they had 15 stories they, they right at the top of their head. Yeah. And I was blown away by that. And so I would encourage all men to go and speak to your female friends, go and speak to your partners, to your family members, Ask them about their experiences, and I promise you, it'll open your eyes to just how widespread this is, and just what a big problem we have to solve here. Yeah, definitely. And uh, in in solving this problem, um, you know, obviously, because like you say, Barry, at the moment it's in the the peak of the news cycle, and it is sad that as you know, as that news cycle slows down, we we stop talking about this. But in, while it's in the peak, um, some some suggestions that have come through are. Uh, curfew for men uh, so you know curfew for men from kind of 9 p.m that no men could be out on the street um, so you know I'd like I'd love to, to hear the ladies takes on that uh, and then secondly uh, I've heard you know that the another measure is to have kind of plain clothes police officers in nightclubs um, which 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 seems interesting uh, because this happened not in a nightclub uh, and it was a policeman who actually committed this this attack uh so ladies what do you think about that uh, whoever whoever wants to answer do you want to go ash <laughs> <I'd> go <for laughs> <you>. <laughs> okay um i think that's shame I, I the the curfew idea is like oh in in a dream world and even if it was just I've, I've had this thought because I've, I've seen it circulating and I've had this thought of just just give us one night, just give us one night ever, 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 mm. where all men are indoors before it gets dark and just let the woman go out and have a good time. And like, oh, I fantasize about it. I went to, um, for example, I went to a Spice Girls concert, uh, I don't know, a year or two ago. And it's Spice Girls, right? So majority of who's there is female 
or females with like their gay best friends or you know I've, I've never felt so safe in an environment it was moms it was daughters it was best friends it was it was proper like a girly night out and I would, I would imagine that that's how it would be something similar to that where you don't feel threatened at all girls were drunk they were having so much fun they were like it oh it was so nice it was it was the safest I've felt on a night out possibly since I've ever started going out you know on on my own as as a young lady um, and it, it was just it was just so refreshing and you know maybe maybe that's in an ideal world it would be lovely to just have just one night of a a girl's girl's world and just feel so safe and like with your like you're with your sisters and all the rest I mean I know it sounds like that but this really does unite a lot of females this topic especially it's because we've all experienced it on some level or the other it really unites females so much and we're so passionate about it but as you say we don't talk about it I mean Barry you said that you've you've spoken to a couple of friends about it and they've got all these stories lined up every female does but we don't we don't tell these stories because who wants to hear that you know like who wants to really listen to us go on and be like well this happened to me and then it, it you know you 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 stand the chance of being made fun of or laughed at or anything like that and I think that even now saying that females need to also then work together and if we're in a group of guys uh, or with a group of guys you know like a mixed um, a mixed six uh, mixed sex group and a guy says something inappropriate doesn't matter how big or small maybe we also need to be like hey that's not okay like come on and call him out in front of his male friends and male peers and just be like that's not all right like think about it and just think about what you're doing so um yeah I mean in terms of the the police officer dressing in normal clothing I think that I think they would be shocked I, I think a club would be a good place to start I mean you can't have these um police officers everywhere and I think Sarah's instant although I know it happens a lot that kind of um kidnapping situation all over the world I think the amount of sexual harassment that goes on in clubs and you know festivals concerts all of these things it's just a huge population there's a lot of alcohol and I think no one would really know if you go missing until it's too late kind of thing so I think that that's a good place that it could start for police officers to actually just dress like everybody else and even just just get involved and just see I don't know it, it both of those suggestions would be I mean the first one is not realistic I understand that it's not it's not punish the you know half of the entire world because you know some idiots but um it's a good place to start for the police to dress up as regular folk Chad, I'm just a little. I'm 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 weary of Ashley's time. I know she's got got to go to work just now. So, Ashley, do you have any final last thoughts before you jump off? Thank you so much for joining us so so early in the morning. Do you have any final thoughts, Ash? Sure, no problem. I just actually wanted to add, um, in response to Chad's question, is that I think these measures are good, but they at the, at the end of the day they're preventative measures. They don't kind of address the ultimate underlying problem, and I think. I think that perhaps a possible measure would be to start educating because it, it starts when you're young, right? It's how you're brought up. It's how you're brought up looking at women, how you're brought up um, showing how to treat women and what's acceptable and what's not acceptable. And I think perhaps maybe having education in schools, if you're not getting that at home or, you know, kind of starting at a more grassroots level so that, at, you know, so that we don't have to years down the line, take the, have to take these preventative measures in the first place. And, you know, although these are good, I do think that the fundam fundamental underlying problem still needs to be addressed and still the conversation still needs to start to happen between men. Yeah, hundred percent agree. Uh, well, thank you so much, ladies, for for joining us and for you know being brave and kind of sharing some of your stories. Uh, I certainly got a heck of a lot from it, and I'm, I have no doubt that uh, a lot of our listeners uh, who will listen to this episode uh, will do. But like like you all said, uh, as long as we kind of keep this dialogue going uh, and keep it a a candid conversation uh, where you we can call people out and not worry about the ramifications because your feelings. Uh, ultimately there's no right or wrong you feel the way you feel 
Um, and, you know, people should take that seriously, uh, whether they you know, believe you or not uh, is, is completely irrelevant. So thank you so much, ladies, for, for joining us uh, tonight. And uh, Barry, I think we should move on. Let's do it. Stuff I found interesting. Alrighty, what a great discussion. I'm trying to get Barry uh, onto this little block over here. There we go. <laughs> there I there am. There he is. There I am. <laughs> Alrighty, Barry. So uh, some stuff we found interesting this past week. I mean, I just just, just to quickly talk on, on, on our previous conversation, I, I really, really did take a heck of a lot from that. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm glad that we, we've kind of just got away from just you and me and from our male perspectives uh, and started to actually uh, empathize uh, with with some of the experiences of of ladies on the ground. Yeah, it's so important, Chad. And I I feel a little bit bad that it's that it's taken this tragedy to bring this conversation up again. I mean, the last time we chatted about this was a while ago. Yeah. So I'm very grateful to 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 Ash and to Danica for for coming on. Um, it it takes a lot of courage to speak about this. We've spoken about the stigma, and I'm hoping that we we see a lot of a lot of positive feedback from this. If you're listening right now and you have these sorts of stories, if you do empathize with us, please let us know. We'd love to hear your experiences, and we're just trying to broaden this conversation as best we can. And so we encourage you to take this out in to the real world um and, and and really make this a part of your your conversation with your people absolutely and uh, just just a quick shout out we've got listeners from from mexico from iraq as well uh so welcome welcome everyone uh, you know you you enjoy enjoy our show welcome to the the tribe um barry let's talk about some stuff we found interesting this past week um you left a link to a youtube video with with nothing else just no descriptions nothing just a link <laughs> to a video uh, it had me rather intrigued and i did give it a nice click but basically in, in hungary there is a road uh that that plays some music crazy Chad, I don't know why, but it made my week when I found this video. I found it so cool. So, yeah. so you know on those highways, they have those like little bumper things that just make sure you're still awake. When you're on those long road trips down to Cape Town or whatever the story is, they've got these little, little like rough edges that just rattle your car and just kind of give you a bit of a shake up to make sure you're not dozing off in the driver's yeah. seat, right? So Hungary have got these, but they've figured out that depending on like the texture and depending on the speed of the car and all these sorts of things, you can make them make sounds. So this video basically shows this car going over a, a range of these little bumps. Each one has a different pitch. And so once they figured that out, they obviously were like, hold on a minute. We can be a little bit creative with this thing. And they've made a road with the pitches perfectly, perfectly timed. So if you drive over at a certain speed, it plays you a song, Chad. Your car plays you a song. It's amazing. <laughs> Just crazy. I mean, we've we've all we've all been in our in our car on the highways, uh, you know, and and heard those. Uh, but yeah, so innovative. I I think it's so great. Uh, what a way to kind of brighten up someone's commute as well. Although if it's your if it's your daily drive uh, and you've you've got another <laughs> sort of soundtrack playing on the background, I'd imagine it'd be uh, quite distracting. But I I definitely I love I love these kind of stories, Barry. Uh, the, the, these kind of things are, are really good. Um, something I found interesting uh, this past weekend is actually interesting today, funnily enough, because this is sort of hot off hot off the press, I think. Um, you know, we always talk about Billie Eilish. Uh, we, we, we're good fans of hers. Uh, she she changed her hair color. We, we know she's been uh, that iconic uh, kind of green and, and black. She's become blonde. Uh, and after posting this photo, it's, it's now, and I, I think it's even more than this. Uh, last I checked, it was north of 18 million likes. Uh, sort of the, the sixth or, or even sort of higher up on that listing, most liked image on Instagram ever. <laughs> <laughs> it's a crazy number, Chad. How do you fathom that many likes? When I get my 34 likes on my photo, I'm very chuffed, Chad. So I can't even imagine <laughs> what it's like to get 16.5 million and counting likes. But like you say, it's Billie Eilish has been known for that green hair. You see that green yeah. hair anywhere, you know immediately it's Billie Eilish. So this is obviously a bold choice and uh, obviously the tabloids run away with it. I think it also helps that the Grammys were a couple of days ago. And so that kind of feeds the frenzy and whatnot because Billy won, won a Grammy with, with uh, yeah. everything I wanted. Um, and so, yeah, a really, really strange one. It, it kind of reminds me, isn't the most liked photo the photo of the egg? Isn't the yes. egg? I think there's an egg photo yes. that's like the most liked photo. So it's definitely a piece of internet trivia that you guys must keep in, keep in touch for your next pub quiz, <laughs> that's for sure. 
<laughs> yeah, that egg one. I didn't. To be honest, I didn't know about it, Barry, until I actually looked up what the. I mean, obviously, when you see a a tweet like this saying that that's now the the sixth most liked photo on Instagram ever, <laughs> you want you want to know what's what's number one. And I, I had a look, and it, it is course. just a picture of an egg. But their goal was <laughs> to to break the record uh, because I think at the time uh, the record was actually held by. Uh, a Kardashian, uh, from from what I can remember, uh, a, a picture was it of not her... the Ellen selfie. Wasn't it the Ellen selfie at the at the Oscars? Do you remember that selfie with all the the famous people? Yes. Who was was <laughs> maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. <laughs> I do, I do, I do. Uh, there, there was another picture. Uh, I'm trying to think of her now, name as well. I'm clearly not very well versed to the Kardashians, uh, but it was a picture of uh, you know of, of a finger and her little baby's hand kind of wrapping around the finger. Um, and that okay. was, okay. I think, at, the, at that time, uh, the, the most liked photo. But yeah, very interesting that in a in a day, Barry, uh, Billy can sort of rise up with a picture of her of a new hairstyle. While we on the subject, I want some of- new music, Chad. I want some new music from <laughs> Billy. That's what I'm waiting for. I'm dying for the second album because everyone's been talking about how iconic the first album was and yeah. how she's going to top it. And so I don't care about her hair, Chad. I want some new music. Come on. <laughs> I mean, I want I want to know whether whether that next album can top it, Barry, because you know that first album was just groundbreaking. Uh, you always do wonder when it comes to an art that is so. I'm not gonna say hit or miss, but but it, you really do need inspiration uh, to strike in a moment to produce something as amaz- as amazing as that. Uh, you, you do wonder whether it can be kind of recreated on that scale. You wonder that until you come across humans like Jacob Collier. Uh, who bangs out <laughs> four albums in a year. And and I wanted to talk about that just a little bit, Barry, uh, while we're on the subject of Grammys, because uh, you were quite disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Chad. So anyone who knows me knows how much I love this man. And uh, I was very excited when he got nominated for... He, he's, he's won, f- I think, four Grammys before this, um, but more in the... the ac- not a ac- cappella, the arrangement categories, the, the those sorts of categories, right? Not the major, major mainstream categories. And in this year's Grammys, his his latest album, Jesse Volume 3, got nominated for Album of the Year. Yeah. And and that is a big deal because it's like the it's the award at the Grammys, competing against Taylor Swift, Post Malone, uh, who else was it against? Coldplay, like a lot of huge, huge music names. And Jacob Collier snuck in there. And so I got a bit carried away because I read a few articles saying, maybe he's a dark horse. Maybe he's got a chance. You never know. And so I was holding on to a teensy, teensy bit of hope, Chad. <laughs> and I nearly stayed up until three in the morning to watch it. But eventually I was like, that's ridiculous. I've actually got to work tomorrow. So I woke up the next morning to find out that unfortunately, Chad, he did not win. And a good old Tay-Tay took it in that category. So I was a little bit disappointed, but he did win another one. So... I can't be that sad, right? Yeah, I mean, he's the first British artist, I think, who has won a Grammy for each of his first four albums. Um, I mean, you certainly can't comp- complain at that at that sort of level. Um, obviously, he's a he's a gifted gifted musician. Um, but uh, but yeah, that that was very interesting. And then, of course, we've got the Oscars coming up too, Barry, which uh, I think is is fascinating because there wasn't a whole lot released this past <laughs> year uh, for obvious reasons. We were chatting offline, Chad. About we could have made our own movie and maybe been nominated. Because I think if you made a movie in 2020, you would have got nominated. So, so who knows? Who knows? I don't even know what's come out. To be honest, I, I, I think Soul is probably the the favorite, the animated movie with Jamie Foxx. But I don't know what else. To be honest. Yeah. Well, let's see. Let's see. Uh, in when is it? In, in a week's time or whatever the case is, we'll we'll keep our eyes peeled. Uh, Barry, let's move on to our next segment. Looking ahead. We've we've spoken a bit about deep fakes before, Barry, uh, with a, a president in, in Gabon or, or something like that. Uh, there's been something I'd say a lot more known to kind of mainstream media. Who better to deep fake than Tom Cruise? The man, the myth, the legend, Chad. One of <laughs> obviously one of the most iconic actors in the world. A, a little bit crazy, a little bit nuts, and so it's the perfect mix of celebrity and a little bit crazy to pull off this sort of deep fake. And this kind of started on TikTok. I'm not sure the guy who, who actually made these TikToks, but there was a whole bunch of TikToks made of these deep fakes that looked incredible, Chad. I don't know if you saw them, but they were so well done. They were almost perfect. And you look at it and it's 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 pretty uncanny. And it's hard to believe that that's actually not the real Tom Cruise. And so it obviously caused another whole stir in the community about what, what do deep fakes actually mean? What is the, the good sides and the bad sides? And where is this technology going? But I read a fascinating article about it. Like 
people also got carried away because it looked really, really good and really realistic. But what you didn't realize was that this wasn't just an app that someone just pl- plugged yeah. his face yeah. up or something, right? This was a, a very ca- carefully calculated thing. They got someone who looked very much like Tom Cruise already, mm-hmm. which already helps. And they spent weeks and weeks tweaking the algorithm to make it absolutely perfect. And so if you haven't seen these Tom Cruise deep fakes, do go and Google them. They really are special. And they point to where this technology is going, Chad, which is a rather scary place in my opinion. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I've I've got a little a little clip here. I mean, you 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 would never believe that that's that that's a deep fake. It's just crazy. But but as you say, this isn't just you know some random guy uh, plugging it into some very easily accessible app. Uh, this is someone I understand who who uh, is in the world of film. Um, so you know yes. he he does video effects for a living. Uh, and like you say, uh, he looks like Tom Cruise too, which, which is just insane. But um, it, it certainly does. It certainly does beg the question, um, you know, of 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 concern, really. Uh, as as a person who puts out a whole lot of content, uh, and where there's so many, you know, variations on <laughs> facial angles and vocal tone and all that kind of stuff, um, I definitely think it's something we're going to be talking a lot more about in the future. I I think Chad, in about five to ten years time. The use of synthetic media is going to be one of the biggest conversations on, on on the platform because at the moment, like you say, it takes a lot of effort, it takes a lot of expertise, it takes like a lot of this stuff. But we're seeing the tech accelerate at a, at a speed that's unheard of. And so I really do think this is going to become one of the biggest things we chat about in the future, talking about what is real video, right? At the moment, video evidence is kind of held up as this number one piece of evidence because it's very hard to fake it, right? But that is disappearing. And if you can make someone say anything that you want and and feed it into a fake news ecosystem where there's these echo chambers and it's been proven that people can run these misinformation campaigns, it gets very dangerous and gets very dodgy very quickly. And so I think as a community, everyone is trying to figure out what they're going to do. We've chatted a little bit in the past about blockchain solutions trying to verify original media and trying to put some sort of digital watermark on it to say, cool, this is the real thing and not a deep fake. But unfortunately, that's just not there yet. And so, mm. yeah, it's going to be interesting to, see, to watch over the next couple of years. At the moment, it's a lot of fun to seeing Tom Cruise do some silly things. <laughs> but if you take that a little bit further and you get to a point where it starts to impact on, on the actual world and the important things that matter, then we're in, we're in trouble. I agree. I, I completely agree. Um, especially when the, the technology gets better, Barry. I think that's the whole thing is at the moment, it is still at that stage where you need to be a, a pro in animation or, you know, graphics uh, manipulation to, to, to get something that looks you know fairly realistic. But uh, we, we will get to the point, you know, we will get to that space where uh, you do have the technology that's available for this. I mean, if you, th- if you think about iPads and iPhones having these face ID sensors that 3D map your face. Um, I mean, we, we talk about emojis and all that kind of stuff. I know we, we've had a good amount of fun with them before in the past. Uh, but, you know, as soon as that technology becomes available, uh, who's to say it's not going to be rolled out as an app on your, on your iPhone? Definitely. And, and a lot of this computation is now happening on the device. So you don't even need a fancy supercomputer. You don't need any of these deep learning networks on the cloud. But because the phones are getting better and better and better, you're going to get to a point where it becomes commoditized, right? And at that point, it's like, what is real then? What is a real video? And um, we've seen with Photoshop, and Photoshop has had this a similar thing where you can doctor images relatively easily and make it mm. look really believable in a, in a wide range of ways. And it's coming to video, it's coming to audio, and it's really going to change the way we think about media overall. Um, and so, yeah, I, it's it's hard to see it's hard to see if we're going to be able to stop this. I think we have to find a way to manage it, to regulate it, to, to invent new technologies to try and help us figure out what is real and what isn't real. And that's going to be a, a lot of fun for the for the technology builders, that's for sure. Yeah, one hundred percent. Like you say, hopefully some sort of watermarks uh, that uh, that can get recognized across devices. Uh, talking about computation, uh, I, I wanted to I wanted to bring this up, and I should have brought it up when we were talking about Jacob Collier. Uh, I found on his uh, on his Instagram page, he he posted that he was about to release an NFT or a few NFTs uh, as a as a crazy sort of superhuman who uh, produces tracks with hundreds of. Uh, you know, tracks upon tracks upon tracks, effects, uh, harmonies, all that kind of stuff. Uh, basically, releasing an NFT, which is like a high-resolution image, uh, 
export of one of his projects. Uh, and of course, all of his fans went, went crazy for the prospect of this. Uh, and they came with some extra perks too, being able to attend soundtracks and certain gigs and all that kind of stuff. Um, but NFT is a, is a pretty new technology. And we were talking about this only just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, something he didn't realize perhaps. And it's something I didn't realize either, Chad. I mean, we chatted about it a couple of weeks ago and I was very excited about the potential and I still am excited about the potential. It's all I've been reading about over the past week. I think it is a really fascinating piece of technology and I think it's going to change the way we think about digital art going forward. But basically, what I didn't realize was some of the environmental impacts of these NFTs, right? So it's a bit difficult to explain because I still don't get the technical side, even though I'm trying to understand it. I'm trying to upskill myself. But it takes an awful lot of energy and electricity to actually mint these NFTs and to hold them on the blockchain to be able to trade them back and forth. And so when you are making these pieces of art, there's there's an environmental impact that some people aren't taking into account. Now, what made it ironic was J Jacob in his Instagram post when he was announcing this, the reason he was selling these was to try and raise money to offset his carbon footprint for his yeah. upcoming world tour. So there was tragic irony that people jumped all over. And so I, I remember going to his Twitter account and just looking at the comments. And Chad, there must have been thousands of comments. And I would say 90% of them were negative, talking about how, how dare you do this because of this environmental impact. And I think that he, he heard that because about a day mm. later, he pulled the whole thing down. He said, I'm really sorry. I'm going to rethink this. And he, and he kind of canceled the whole, the whole minting process. So I think there's a big conversation here to be had around the sustainability and the environmental impact of these blockchains. I think something that people don't talk about when it comes to Bitcoin is the amount of electricity Bitcoin uses to run their network is a big problem. And yeah. it's one of the things that 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 the, 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 the skeptics or the critics keep bringing up as something we have to solve because we can't keep going the way we're going mm -hmm. just because of the amount of, I mean, the number of server farms sitting in warehouses in China that are mining Bitcoin is just crazy, right? And they're just burning electricity for these for these tokens so i think the environmental impact of cryptocurrency is something that's starting to come into the into the mainstream and starting to be talked about and this jacob is is, is, is this jacob um thing that happened is a great example of that of someone someone finding out that okay i need to do some more research into this and even though nfts are very hot right now we need to maybe be thinking a bit more carefully about how we yeah. do it yeah, yeah, potentially there's a there's an alternative to it. I mean, I, I couldn't even begin to fathom the, the technology that is driving NFTs or, or understand why the, the computation is as demanding as it is. Uh, but just in terms of cryptocurrency, I mean, I, I knew friends who were mining uh, right at the beginning of, uh, you know, of Bitcoin. And uh, yeah, they ended up making a heck of a lot of money, uh, obviously for obvious reasons. Uh, but obviously, as as it becomes more and more of it, uh, you need a lot more servers putting in the work, uh, you know, because ultimately, the, the bigger this beast is, uh, the more there is to to update and and process and transfer through in real time. It it. it it's a little bit of that, Chad, but it's more the fact that there's so many more miners. So in essence, you're competing, right. right? Miners are competing to win the Bitcoin for verifying that transaction. And so like you say, right at the beginning, you could mine on your laptop and that was absolutely mm. fine. Whereas today, you've got no chance because yeah. you're competing against ginormous warehouses full of supercomputers, right? And so the days of mining for an individual are completely gone. Like you just can't do it, especially on Bitcoin. But I came across a very interesting new cryptocurrency called Chia. And I literally found out about it today. And I've started mining it myself, okay. Chad. It's very exciting. Okay. And, and, and what makes it interesting is that their whole thing is that they want to be environmentally neutral. So... I won't get into the technical side, but they, they are taking a different perspective on what a cryptocurrency is. They're going for what's called proof of stake rather than proof of work. So proof of work is, is what Bitcoin is built on. And basically, it's just pure computing power, pure yeah. brute force. That's how you mine. Whereas proof of stake is a little bit different. It's, it's, it's not about the computing power at all. It's just about how much of the network you're willing to help and how much kind of storage you're giving, et cetera. And so for this for this, for this um, Chia cryptocurrency basically what happens is you are you give them a portion of your storage your hard drive storage so for example you've got a you've got a external hard drive that's got 100 gigs free that you're not using you let the network use that storage and in exchange you start to mine or they call it farming because they're trying to change the the, the terminology right. you farm these chia tokens and so i've been playing with it today and i think it's quite exciting obviously the 
there's there's thousands of these coins, so it's very likely it goes to zero, and you, and you can't do anything with the tokens just yet. But it's an example of some of the innovations that are coming down the line that are trying to cater for some of Bitcoin's um, weaknesses, right? And so it's making everyone think a little bit differently about is Bitcoin going to be the one that succeeds, right? Personally, I think cryptocurrency is going to be here. I think it's inevitable, but it's a question of which one and which ones, right? And it might not necessarily be Bitcoin. It might be something that comes after Bitcoin that improves on the the kind of technology and really pushes the boundaries of what's possible. So there's lots of interesting things in this space. And I think the environmental side of things is something that hasn't got the attention it deserves. And I'm glad to see it starting to come into the mainstream. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you certainly are pushing pushing that MacBook Air, Barry, to its limits <laughs> um, by by mining. But but hey, why not uh, get involved while you know while it's still early and while there's still opportunity? Uh, that question of which one is going to be the one is, is an interesting question, though, because as as this journey unfolds, the more we kind of keep questioning each cryptocurrency and whether it is the one, surely we just Put, put ourselves further and further away from the goal of having this currency that is uh, globally accepted, uh, that is a viable alternative to the rest of the, the sort of fiat currencies. D- don't you think about that, where you have this opportunity to endlessly create new currencies all the time, and there's always one that's got uh, some other element to it, some other you know unique proposition. Are we not kind of you know working against this goal of actually uh, transitioning over to digital currency potentially but but and you, we we can't we can't just keep going down the path of bitcoin if it's going to end up destroying the world's energy yeah, resources no, right for sure. like you can't get to a point 10 years down the line where it takes 18 warehouses full of supercomputers to send a bitcoin to each other yeah. so the, the the scalability of the network really matters and so we we, we keep forgetting we are so early in this. We are so, so early in this transformation. Um, Bitcoin's been around for about 12 years now, and it's still it's still a teenager. It's like a baby, baby little thing. And we're still learning about how we're going to scale these things going forward. Of course, we, we talk about this one currency to rule the world, and that's a very idealistic idea. Whether it actually happens, I don't know. Like That's, that's a question we don't know the answer to. It's something that People think might be a might be a solution, but maybe it's not a solution. Maybe we do have a bunch of different currencies for different sorts of use cases. But mm. even beyond the currency thing, there's going to be so many more use cases. Like these NFTs are a great example. It's not currency that it's an asset. It's like a it's a securitization of a piece of digital art, which is very interesting. You've got all these smart contracts that are doing really interesting things when it comes to to forecasting and bets and uh, contracts and real estate. And there's so many use cases, and all these tokens are designed for different things. And so yeah, I, I, I just want to caution people who think that Bitcoin yeah. is the be all and end all, and they're putting their life savings into it. I would just caution you. And say, listen, like obviously, obviously, there's a reason it's stuck around. There's a reason it's on a huge run. And I'm still an investor, so I'm just full disclaimer there. I still believe in it, but I think we just have to be careful about thinking about this more sustainably and and whether Bitcoin is going to be able to scale in the way we think it's going to be able to scale, or if something else is going to come and usurp it. Yeah, absolutely. I'm I'm just having a I've got a little smirk on my face because <laughs> I missed the opportunity of using our Bitcoin background, uh, which which I got because we speak about it so often, um, and and for good reason. Uh, but but yeah, we 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 we've got to have it on you, Barry. Um, yeah, I completely agree. Let's let's definitely see what what lies ahead in the future there, um, and what other implications and use cases people can come up with. Uh, let's then shift on over to uh, to COVID to vaccines uh obviously you know w- this achievement this accomplishment of getting a vaccine out within a year uh in 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 sometimes some of the vaccines obviously they all have different uh, ways of working some of them have used pretty groundbreaking technology in in attacking the the spike protein and doing all all of these uh, all of these good things uh, there are potentially some some good side effects uh, from having a vaccine like this Definitely. And I think it's one of the, the examples of what happens when you throw the world scientists all at one problem, right? Yeah. For the last year, the best medical and scientific minds in the world have been working on one thing. And like you say, it's developed these range of vaccines around the world that are proving very, very powerful and very effective. But what's really cool is that in, in the same way that any 
any kind of engineering feature or any kind of breakthrough in, in science happens, there's all these side effects that you don't realize is going to happen. And so I found this story that is very interesting that they may, th they think they may have a potential malaria vaccine that's come out of the mm -hmm. same sort of way of thinking. So the way that they've used this RNA mechanism to, to do this in the, in the Pfizer and in AstraZeneca and all these vaccines Potentially, there's there's a way to use that same mechanism, but to target malaria instead of COVID. And so there's been some some trials that have gone very well so far. It's still very early in the process. But the idea is that if things keep going the way they're going, they can replicate this process towards the malaria. Maybe we can create a vaccine for malaria. And that would be a huge, hmm. huge Nobel Prize winning thing because malaria has killed more people than anything else in the history of humanity. So wars, black death, any of the stuff, malaria has killed more people than anything. It's the number one killer. And while while most of the developed world has kind of eradicated it, it's still absolutely rampant in sub-Saharan sub Africa and a lot of, of developing countries. And so if we were able to find some sort of vaccine against malaria, it would be an absolute game changer. <clears throat> and so it's a reminder of these things these random side effects that it's almost like a blessing that COVID's given us yeah. if this if this turns out the way it is, yeah. right? It's a little bit of a blessing. And it kind of it takes me back to that that discussion about space exploration, Chad, and about how the reason we should be exploring space is it's not necessarily because of the space, it's because mm -hmm. of all the engineering breakthroughs that will come with it that will then trickle down. And this is a great example of that. Yeah, I hope I hope it is the case. I really, really do. I think it's a it's a trial we need to be following very closely. Uh, and I think, you know, malaria is obviously w one example, but I I'm sure there's a whole bunch of other sort of illnesses and, and ailments uh, that, that really affect humans in the most profound ways uh, that the technology that we've been able to come up with, like you say, with the best scientists in the world all working on one thing, um, I think it's wonderful. And uh, like you say, there's not been much, you know, in the positive way of things that uh, from from COVID nineteen. Uh, but if this is one of them, then amazing. And and also just looking at the effect of malaria and where it is densely populated in sub-Saharan Africa, where there aren't resources, uh, you know, to, to tackle this particular problem. I mean, we've, we've spoken about philanthropic work, uh, you know, of, uh, of Bill Gates in the past and some of the great stuff that he's done that side to, to kind of alleviate sort of unnecessary death, if that makes any sense. Uh, and, uh, and this would be wonderful where you've got all of the leading nations around the world who have come up with something that is amazing, uh, that can then be slightly tweaked, uh, and have profound impacts, uh, on, you know, lesser wealthy parts of the globe. Yeah, definitely. It really is an exciting story, and and I, I'm I'm hoping that it's not just getting ahead of itself. I'm hoping there's something of substance there. But what I think it points to is that we need to take all this progress we've made in this vaccine development and see what we can do with it. Right? Mm. We've now we've now we we've, we've we've got all these vaccines for COVID, and let's not waste all of that all of that work. Let's try and see how can we use those same mechanisms to tackle other problems and other diseases that we're facing. Um, and so I'm very excited by it. I definitely want to keep an, keep an eye on it because um, it really would be a huge, huge deal if that was the case. Absolutely. Well, let's, let's definitely keep a close eye on those trials uh, to see how they unfold. Barry, I think we've had a pretty good episode today. Uh, a lot, a lot of uh, you know sh experience sharing, a lot of insight, a lot of introspection. I think for all of us to do after this episode, uh, and and following that, hopefully, uh, a whole lot of accountability uh, on our own part, and also on the way we, uh, you know, encourage people to do things they shouldn't be doing, uh, call them out on things on on those exact things uh, in the future as well. Uh, after after this discussion. Yeah, definitely. Let's not let this be the end of it. Let's not let the when this when the Sarah Everard story kind of drops out of the news cycle, we need to continue talking about it. Mm. And so I hope that we've said it, I hope that we've kind of done our best to do it justice and try and bring some of these topics to light. I really would encourage anyone listening or watching right now. What can you do in your own personal life to really make this part of your your day to day conversations? Right? How can you bring this up? How can you hold your friends accountable to our male friends out there? How can you kind of stand up and 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 really show an example of what the kind of world we want to build is? We're all kind of dealing with this idea of <clears throat> what does modern what does modern masculinity mean? Right? 
what does it mean to be a man in, in 2021? And I think a lot of it comes down to kind of rethinking these societal norms, the way we've been brought up, the way that things happen at nightclubs and in bars and these places, and just trying to think about them more objectively and more honestly. And, mm. and for me, I know the first step for me was just hearing those stories from female friends and Definitely. getting a sense of how bad the problem actually is. Because until you hear it from someone you know and kind of see the emotion and see the feelings, it's easy to brush aside. It's easy to kind of push to the side and sweep under the rug. And so I would encourage you to please go and speak to your female friends, ask them about their experiences. And, and that for me is the first step to really empathize with what's going on and then taking action from there. Completely agree. Completely agree. And it's it, it's like like you say, Barry. It's it's not a a quick thing that that we're going to fix overnight. Uh, but if we if we do put in the work and we do go and have those discussions, uh, there's a whole lot of value there. And uh, hopefully, the the next generation is left a whole lot in a in a much better state than than you know we have currently, where where fathers are able to you know teach these values onto their kids in the way that should have been done. Uh, for however long um, but of course then also looking at you know the education in schools uh, and and just defi- redefining the norm redefining the norm uh, which I think is is so important well thank you so much for tuning in if you did a dial in with a live or otherwise uh, we always love having you here if you could do us one massive favor and recommend us to one friend of yours who you think would enjoy this podcast. Obviously, we want to grow. Obviously, we want, uh, you know, we want to, to, to extend this family, um, you know, of bringing a whole bunch of joy every single week. Uh, and yeah, other than that, it's time to a bid farewell. Have a good week. And thanks for tuning in to Across the Pond. Pond, pond across the-